Tonight on Greater Boston, the newly named editor-in-chief of the Journal of the American Medical Association, Dr. Kirsten Bibbins Domingo, joins me on making history as the first person of color in the role and how a career focused on health equity will inform her leadership at a publication with a rocky history on equity and on race. Later on, we'll take a closer look at the representation in running ahead of Monday's 126th running of the Boston Marathon and one woman looking to make a difference. Plus, national security expert Juliet Kayyem joins me on her new book, The Devil Never Sleeps, on how to navigate a world full of an increasing number of disasters. It's been nearly a year since a Boston pediatrician stepped down as editor-in-chief of the Journal of the American Medical Association, the result of another editor questioning whether racism even existed in medicine on a JAMA-affiliated podcast, a question JAMA later promoted on Twitter. This week, the journal announced his successor, the first person of color, and only second woman ever to serve in the job, Dr. Kirsten Bivens Domingo, who joins me now. She's a longtime health equity researcher and advocate, an internist, cardiovascular disease epidemiologist, and a professor at UC San Francisco. Doctor, good to meet you. Nice to meet you. Congratulations, I guess, but you said it's your dream job. Uh, a dream job walking into an editorship of a publication that's been mired in quite a bit of controversy. Well, there's no question that JAMA and the JAMA network of journals um, um, are a uh, really extraordinary platform that is publishing high quality science, high quality science across the broad array of medicine. And, um, and that's what makes this job a dream job, having the chance to shape uh, the, the type of communication, the type of science that's mm -hmm. published uh, to the broad audience that JAMA and the JAMA Network of Journals reach. And that's what I was excited about. I think it's never been more important to have a journal and a network that is um, transmitting high quality science, talking about the yeah. issues of the day that shape science and medicine and doing so with a trusted voice and a broad reach. You know, you said at the time of your uh, selection, this is an extraordinary time, as you just said, for science, medicine, and public health. I would agree, but maybe not in the exact same way. I want to put up a couple of polls from uh, January of this year. I'm sure they won't surprise you. From the Nork Center for Public Affairs, would you say you have a great deal of confidence in the scientific community? 64% yes, Democrats, only 34 Republicans. Would you say you have a great deal of confidence in medicine, both underwater, 45% Democrats, 34% Republicans. How do you break through that level of cynicism and polarization? Yeah, I think what makes this a really, um, really uh, interesting time is that um, we are at um, really a, a pinnacle of, of um, modern uh, science and medicine, the ability during this pandemic to translate so quickly into highly effective vaccines, highly effective treatments. And yet um, within the same pandemic, we have uh, divisions across here. You've highlighted political lines. Um, we have divisions across many lines in the way in which that same science is viewed by, by different audiences. And I think that is, um, it, it is an interesting time. We see this actually across a number of sectors. I think as many people point out, when an institution, when people lose faith in an institution, it's also incumbent upon that institution to help restore faith. Some of that is about um, understanding what it is that we're publishing. And some of it is about uh, thinking about the many ways in which we communicate to a diverse audience, diverse across multiple yeah. dimensions, including, including political, as you suggest. I, I want to talk about restoring faith, to use your expression, of following these instances, and they're not isolated, of racism. That podcast I mentioned, I mentioned the tweet now deleted by, your, by JAMA. No physician is racist, so how can there be structural racism in healthcare? An explanation of the idea by doctors for doctors in this user-friendly pod. I mean, I speechless. And it, obviously, it's not just in the publication. I remember, I'm sure you do better than I, a few years ago, I think it was 220 white residents were surveyed. More than half of them thought their black patients had thicker skin, had higher resistance to pain. And it's almost like a science fiction movie. How do you fix what is clearly broken? 
Right. Uh, the, the first thing is for us to be able to talk about it, name it, and be truthful about what it is uh, that, that medicine and science don't exist apart from the larger conversations, the larger structural biases, racism, and inequities that exist within society. And in fact, in many ways, races, uh, racism in medicine contributes to the larger issues of um, structural inequities that we see. If we as a larger society, and then in particular in our profession in science and medicine, want to address these issues, we cannot be slow to name them. We cannot be slow to acknowledge both the history as well as its influence on our uh, current contemporary practice. Uh, doing so is the important first step in uh, righting this wrong. I think uh, the podcast and the tweet and the types of self-reflection that JAMA and the JAMA Network have gone through over this last year um, are emblematic, actually, of the entire um, uh, the entire situation that medicine and science mm -hmm. have to go through. Um, and and I think that's the important thing to remember. None of us immu is immune. This is not a single person's issue. Um, but if Gemma wants to be a trusted voice for science and medicine, we have to be the first to acknowledge very clear things that are shaping medicine. As I mentioned when I introduced you, Doctor, health equity has been at the center of your. Career, are, are you of the opinion that the spotlight that has been put on health inequity during COVID provides fertile ground for work like yours? Or is this like a passing thing? We care about it deeply and then we just move on. Yeah, it's complex, as, as you just said. Um, it's complex because I, in a good way, it has uh, the pandemic has shown a light, as many have said, on the deep inequities that existed well before the pandemic and the pandemic made worse. There's also very interesting science out there right now that is suggesting that as people talk about the pandemic, and the inequities in the pandemic, it leads others to think that the pandemic is about those people, uh, experiences of yeah. other people. And it actually, sometimes um, we have to be cognizant of it because of the way it is heard by others. And so that's the challenge, I think, of a great journal is to continue to communicate the science, uh, to be, continue to be clear on um, the issues that are faced by multiple communities across the U.S. and globally in the types of, of diseases that we are covering, but also to, to do that in a way that, that continues to engage um, in a truthful way at the forefront uh, so that um, we can help to, to move science and medicine along. Can we focus on one health equity issue for a second? I'm sure you saw the op-ed in Elle magazine that Serena Williams wrote after giving birth. I'll read just the part. In the U.S., black women are nearly three times more likely to die during or after childbirth than their white counterparts. Being heard and appropriately treated was the difference between life and death for me. I know those statistics would be different if the medical establishment listened to every black woman's experience. As you know, it's black uh, maternal health week, the Boston Globe in a piece this afternoon said giving birth while black should not be a death sentence. But it's clear to me as a non-medical professional, it's not just about better health care and better listening. It's addressing all the social determinants from can you get to the doctor with affordable transportation? Do you have decent nutrition, good schools, safe neighborhoods? That's a big nut to crack. Is this society ready to address health equity in that kind of fashion? Yeah, it's a big nut to crack, but what I, I love about uh, Serena Williams using her voice in this way is that it highlights a, a really important health issue right now, the fact that our maternal mortality rates are on par with um, countries we don't usually show up yes, on the indeed. same list on, and uh, that is something that we should all feel shame in and uh, work actively to try to uh, reverse. But the issues that you're talking about, the issues of access and, and socioeconomic status and, and uh, where you're going to receive care, which affect so many in the US and absolutely contribute to maternal mortality, are not the issues that contributed to Serena's case. And it does highlight that we have to talk about uh, 
all of these issues together, including the types of, of issues of bias and racism that clearly lead, uh, lead certain people to have different encounters in clinical settings than other people. And we have to be willing to talk on these issues and understand the complexities. All of these issues are important. And the fact that they're contributing to these shockingly high rates of maternal mortality are ones that we need to be talk about and see um, interventions that are reversing them. Doctor, once again, congratulations. I wish you a lot of luck. Hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you. U.S. security officials have been on alert since the moment it started to look like Russia would invade Ukraine, warning U.S. companies and citizens alike of potential cyber attacks. But yesterday, they kicked things up a notch, with multiple agencies issuing a joint alert about a suite of malicious cyber tools capable of sabotaging the energy sector and other critical industries. My next guest has been preparing U.S. agencies for threats like these for decades and preparing them for how to respond should they occur anyway, from working in Homeland Security during the Obama administration to a role as former Governor Deval Patrick's security advisor, Juliette Kayyem has laid the groundwork for how to deal with disasters, both natural and man-made. She has a new book out on the subject, and I think Governor Charlie Baker probably summed it up best when he joined us on Boston Public Radio recently to interview Juliette about it. The devil never sleeps. If you read this book, you will never sleep. <laughs> And indeed, I have not. The author, Juliette Kayyem, that's not true, joins me now. She's a professor of international security at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, CNN commentator, and of course, a longtime regular on Boston Public Radio. Juliette, congratulations. Good to see you. Thank you. Thanks for having me here. What's the devil that's never sleeping? Yeah. The devil can be anything. So the purpose of the book was to say, uh, look, the harms that we face from a cyber attack to obviously a pandemic, terrorism, as we uh, are all too familiar with, to natural disasters, uh, are, are threats and risks that are ongoing just because of globalization, our connectivity. So what I wanted to do with the book is to lay a a, a framework for thinking about disaster management and thinking about success in disaster management. Uh, so to sum it up quickly, I, I want to teach people how uh, to, uh, to learn to fail safer. In other words, to expect something bad to happen and to measure success by whether we limit the harm, limit the damage, obviously limit the deaths, and return back to normal. Uh, and, and to get, and, and what are the tools to do that is an important, uh, uh, important advice to give to the American public, to give to leaders, CEOs, uh, and government leaders. You know, we're just a couple of days away from the marathon and everybody yeah. watching remembers in painful detail what happened in 2013. And while obviously there was the horror of the three people who died on the course and other after, uh, uh, the amazing part to me, and I think virtually everybody, was of the 100 plus injured, some in very serious fashion, none of them, none of them died. Is that right. not an example of exactly what you're talking about? That's exactly right. So we are, we're simple people in disaster management. We divide the world into 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 two time zones. One is uh, uh, left a boom, we call it, which is all the prevention and all the all the things intelligence that go into trying to stop a bad thing from happening. The boom is could be anything, uh, including two brothers at the finish line right. at the Boston Marathon. And the right is how we respond. And I want people to think about uh, uh, sort of a less bad standard. And, and Boston Marathon is in my book because while the tragedy at the marathon, of course, is that three people uh, were killed immediately looking looking back at it for many years. Uh, the amazing thing is because of the efforts and preparedness and response to the boom, uh, we were able to limit the damage. And that included not just the training, but the ability to pivot, the communication plan, family re reunification. So that just like what you said, Jim, uh, if you made it to a hospital, you survive. Yeah. These are numbers that we generally don't see in most disasters. And that goes to that, you know, people think Boston Strong is an attitude. No, Boston Strong was investments in the kind of expectation of, of something bad happening and all the preparation that went into it. You know, you have uh, uh, virtually every page is another great example, some of which we're familiar with, some of which we won't be familiar with. I was half familiar with the the retelling that was most dramatic to me. When you compare 
one nuclear facility in yeah. Japan with another similarly situated nuclear facility that I'd never heard of. Tell the story oh, if you would, Julia. Yes. Yeah. Um, no, I appreciate that. And, and, and uh, what the stories I tell in the book, I should say, are, are meant to be not, not scary, like Governor Baker said, almost they are, some of them are scary, uh, but also to, to get people to relate to disasters in a way that they could understand. So I just basically tell a lot of stories uh, from, from the Trojan horse to, to get all the way to Surfside. And uh, Fukushima, of course, was the nuclear facility that uh, impacted by an, er an earthquake in the ocean, a tsunami coming off into the Japanese coastline. And Fukushima uh, is a nuclear facility, does not react in time does not has not prepared to fail safer has ignored warning signs from the past uh, stones that sit above it on, on the cliffs above where it was uh, built that say do not bu uh, build below this line but I more importantly story. yeah more importantly you know a, a society that had convinced itself uh, that nuclear energy was perfectly safe and part of that is the history of, of their uh, of, of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the attacks, the nuclear mm -hmm. attacks on Japan. Go down the block a couple miles, and this is a story you don't hear. There's a different facility, Onagawa, where people are trained to fail safer. In other words, they're going to measure success not in whether everything goes well, right? Because that can, that can't possibly be true in all cases, uh, but but whether they can respond and fail in a way that minimizes the harm. That nuclear facility had had damage from the earthquake, got lost. Lots of water from the tsunami, but did not have a radiation leak. So I, I the reader will will be steered towards the other story uh, rather than thinking Fukushima represents all nuclear energy, right? It doesn't. We can build nuclear facilities, for example, uh, safer. Uh, and safely, I don't use the word safe because we obviously live in a high risk society. You know, uh, when you and Governor were having uh, the governor were having a conversation on our show, it, it's clear that it's not just strategy and preparation. It's also their political considerations. Yeah. And he talked about spending more than a hundred million dollars almost right away when he took office after the right. blizzard of 2015 and the disasters that came with it for people. And after he told that story, you brought up something called the preparedness mm -hmm. paradox. Explain what that is, Julia. Yeah. So we're, cha we're challenged politically uh, by, by the preparedness uh, paradox. The pre preparedness paradox is essentially the more investment you make in 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 the moment of the boom right and getting ready for it that i i throughout the book i talk about you are here now right mm -hmm. this is this is the moment uh that uh, the more investments you make in it, the better you do when the devil does come, whatever it can be. And then people will wonder, well, why did we invest so much in that concern? Because nothing really bad happened. The best example of that, of course, is Y2K, when billions of dollars were mm -hmm. spent to get our, our computers upgraded, uh, prepared for the number 2000. Uh, 2000 comes along uh, uh, and not much bad happened. And people look back at that and go, everyone overreacted. Nope. It was that everyone invested in that the boom that the boom could come, and what were we going to do to be able to to get through that process? So the only res the political response to the preparedness paradox is to not view disasters as random and rare. They are now standard operating procedure, and that the investments we make in in perpetual preparedness uh, are investments in today. They are not investments in some you know resilient world of unicorns and rainbows in the future. And if people can begin to see that, though, there's a lot we can do today, right? I, 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 want a, I want a better world in the future, but that's going to come later today uh, to minimize the harm that we that we are not going to be able to stop 100% of the time. So it's, it's a realistic book, but one that I hope gives people agency as well. Otherwise, you're going to feel frustrated and, and paralyzed all the time. And the people you give agency to, it should be clear, it's not just CEOs and no. elected leaders. You, you I think, use the phrase, all of us are crisis managers, yeah. and that includes the man or woman running his or her home and their family. All of these lessons apply to them as well, yes? 
That's exactly right. So, uh, you know, from the highest level CEOs uh, to the uh, to the parent and the family members. I mean, obviously, after the pandemic, we certainly know this to be true. Uh, but I, what I wanted to to do with the book, or what I did with the book, is say, look, everything, you know, all these different harms can occur. The causes are often different, right? Look at the subway attack this week in New York. Mm-hmm. And we, you know, who is that? What's his motivation? In some ways, it's irrelevant because from central centuries of of disasters I that I that I that I write about and draw lessons from you essentially can do this in eight easy steps right and they involve communication and fail-safe systems and 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 things that you could do from the home level to the to the CEO to the to the government level and so I want to make it in, in a weird way I want to make disaster management user friendly I want to make it accessible because our investments, personal, institutional, government-wise, will limit the harms, and that's how we often have to measure success. I, I say, you know, we're, we're going to hit a million dead with COVID, um, and it's sort of a shocking number to say it here in the here in the United States alone, relatively soon. And no one, look, we had a pandemic; people were going to die, and the measure of success is. Could we have done that with fewer deaths? I think everyone believes that that is true, right? That is going to be how we look back is the lives that could have been saved with more aggressive preparedness and, of course, uh, a a vaccination program that wasn't sort of fought uh, along the way. You know, we got to go, but I think we're all lucky that you grew up as an earthquake kid in California. (laughs) Got you where you are today. Julia Kayyem, terrific book. Thanks so much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. The book, again, is The Devil Never Sleeps, Learning to Live in an Age of Disasters. I also want to offer an update on a story we brought you back in February when police were pursuing criminal charges against seven Woburn High School students accused of assaulting a freshman football player last fall in multiple incidents, with video of one circulated on social media after. Now, nearly seven months since the first incident, assault charges have finally been filed against all seven students involved, students who Jonathan Casella said jumped him in the locker room, punched and hit him with water bottles, and one of whom pulled down his pants and grabbed his genitals, just one of several assaults, threats, and instances of bullying against him, which he told us in February has had a lasting impact. I lost half of my friends. Like, it's... it's it doesn't feel the same anymore to be out in public. And even in February, Caselis's parents and attorneys shared their frustration about how slowly the wheels of justice were turning and the lack of any charges against the adults involved after Jonathan told a coach about the first assault immediately. And according to them, nothing happened. It gets me emotional every time I have to talk about this because how the school system completely failed to protect one of their students. The family has notified Woburn official that they're planning to sue the city and the school department. The school, for its part, is, says it's conducting a Title IX investigation of the incident. This coming Monday marks the 126th running of the Boston Marathon. And among 30,000 participants is one local woman with a big goal of making running more inclusive in the marathon and beyond. <laughs> Running is really a microcosm of a larger society. So even though it should be all welcoming and inclusive, it's not. This year I'm running the Boston Marathon, um, first time ever. Three, two, one. Boston was something that I never expected to run. I didn't think of it as a welcoming space. Next, Russian twist. That's fine. When you see like the banners all over the city, they're only in specific parts of the city. You don't see them in communities, let's say, of Roxbury or Mattapan. And when you see it on TV or advertised, it always is the Africans and the white runners. So then me, as an African-American, why should I care? Why should I be involved? Because my face, my name, my voice has not been a part of it. My path to running started in 2011. I lost my mother because of cancer, and so I was grieving. And a friend of mine asked me if I wanted to run the Harpoon Five Miler in South Boston. I said, sure, I'll do it, not knowing what the yes would mean. 
the gun went off and I panicked and ran. But in that moment of running, I felt a little lighter. I had been numb for so long and running this race, I actually felt something. So I started to run in my neighborhood and it was healing for me. And then as I was running, I realized I didn't see any other black person running. Like I was the only person who looked like me running and I knew that couldn't be the case. I knew there were other black women who ran, I just didn't know where they are. And the magazines and the media, there's this, this idea of a woman's runner's body, of how she'd be probably tall, thin, white. You don't see like, I have curves, I have an afro, I have dreads, and I run. I've learned that there is this sub-community of black women who do run, who are invisible in this space. And my goal was to make us visible. So again, challenge the power structure because they're educators. I'm a sociology professor at Selma State University. Talking about like, you know, inequality, that what we've been talking about, sociological imagination. So the academic in me was looking up like literature on black women running, and I found hardly anything. And so I thought, well, if I'm not finding any answers, then I need to do the research to find out. What are the experiences of black women who run? Why do black women run? How is that in relationship to running being such a white space? I would run more, and I actually did meet black women. And so that started me with this brilliant idea of running a half marathon in every state to collect data and information. I started this journey in 2015, 2022 will be the final two states on the continent, U.S., and then 2023 will be uh, Hawaii. They all like just remind me of where I started and uh, how far I have to go. Progress is slow, but progress is happening. It shouldn't be uh, just for the moment. It's like, how are we gonna integrate in this into the fabric of us for the long haul, forever? running the Boston Marathon, I feel like this will be my, my I feel welcome and kind of belonging in the space. So it took some time, but when people ask me, you know, have you run the Boston Marathon? I'll be very proud to say, yes, I have. I did it. We'll have much more marathon coverage over the coming days, including an in-depth look at inclusivity in running tomorrow on Basic Black, with several people pushing to expand running programs in communities of color, not just for health reasons, by the way, but as a vehicle for social justice, too. That's tomorrow at 7.30 on GBH2. And then Monday on Boston Public Radio, the first woman to ever complete the Boston Marathon, Bobby Gibb, 2018 winner Des Linden, and former Boston Police Commissioner Bill Evans, who's run Boston dozens of times. They're all among our guests. It's Monday at 11 on GBH Radio at 89.7, but that's it for tonight. Please come back tomorrow for Talking Politics. Adam Riley and his panel will take a look at the newly released plans on how to spend your tax dollars by the Massachusetts House of Representatives and Boston Mayor Michelle Wu. Plus, why advocates say we should keep remote access to public meetings permanently, even if COVID finally fades away. That and more tomorrow at 7. I'll be back next week. Thank you for watching. Please stay safe.